you. Uh, thank you very much for the organizers for, for this wonderful conference and for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and a nice job with the weather. Um, I guess what I'm about to say, well, it's based on joint work with uh, the uh, Shed W. Truman and Harold Williams. And what I'm about to say is probably known to many of the experts here, and almost everyone here is expert, but there are still uh, uh, some uh, uh, graduate students and others, and this talk will be sort of more of a festivist for the rest of us. Um, that's my obligatory science on that, for those who know me. Um, let me give you uh, a main idea. And the punchline is something to This is all that I'm doing. Um, so we'll begin with the uh, contact manifold, and inside that we have a, something Lusandrian. Here's a Lusandrian knot, a picture of one. And maybe we have a symplectic manifold that fills it. Uh, it could be its symplectization, for example. And we have a Lagrangian, a Lagrangian filling of the knot. If it's an exact Lagrangian filling, um, then we make an object of the Fukaya category of this symplectic manifold from it. And uh, apologies to some people that my Fukaya categories will be unwrapped. Um, and from that object, we can put on different local systems. And if we allow ourselves C star local systems, we get um, an algebraic chorus worth of objects. Uh, one for as many. Uh, one C star factor for each homology uh, cycle. And uh, so inside the set of objects of the Fukaya category of S, of Lagrangian manifolds bounding the knot, uh, we get uh, an algebraic torus, and this looks like a cluster chart. But that's the main idea. And this, this idea is. Uh, as I said, it's probably known to many people. And um, apologies for not mentioning everyone's name. I would just I would use up all my time, but they're all here. So thank you for the insights. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> let me give, begin with a little bit uh, talk about some not categories. So I'm going to start, as I said, with a. Uh, uh, I'll use this. It's only four pages, so that's the good thing. I'm a little bit sleepy, so I don't even know if I'll get through that. We have a, a, a knot in what I call T infinity, which is the cosphere bundle, but we think of it living at infinity of a, of a manifold X. And this is Legendrian in the uh, natural contact structure. And we study the Fukaya category of the cotangent. Oh, what am I talking about? Yeah, of the cotangent of X. Uh, with boundary uh, in the Lagrangian. And I'm going to use a uh, result uh, of David Nadler, following in, uh, embedded of David and, and myself, um, that we can discuss the Fukaya category in terms of constructible sheaves. Um, I'm not going to, this talk will be about a category of constructible sheaves, but we're always going to be thinking about it as a Fukaya category. And inside that, we have this uh, category C, which is essentially equal, but um, it will depend on some extra data, which I will probably suppress here. Some uh, points where I want the sheaf to vanish, and maybe this coefficient. Okay. Um, okay, so that's a category, and it's built out of a Lagrangian uh, sub manifold. So far, I haven't fixed uh, the dimension, so we can still be in arbitrary dimensions. And the nice thing is, a theorem of uh, Guillermo, Kashiwara, and, Shapir and Shapira is that this category is an invariant. Invariant under Lusandrian isotopy in the sense that isotopies produce uh, equivalences of categories. And what uh, GKS do is uh, they construct um, a sheaf kernel, uh, K, um, which is a sheaf inside X plus X, cross the interval, so that if you have an isotopy, you can form uh, the pullback push forward 
functor, and that will produce an equivalence. Uh, so this is a, a kernel for this GKS. These are these uh, right. These are uh, D, I think of these as DG categories. <coughs> um, okay. So that's uh, that's the category that we will work with, and there will be a category of constructible sheets, and I'll give you a local description of what that category looks like. Um, actually, from for the rest of the talk, we're going to look at. Uh, in knots. So now it gets simpler, we can draw them on the blackboard. And um, maybe just a remark, this category is interesting. Um, for example, it includes the category of augmentations uh, of the knot, um, which is something that uh, people in selective geometry uh, study, uh, and that, if, if you're not maybe familiar with that, the, the augmentation category includes the whole uh, technology of uh, sorry, linearized contact. And so that's, uh, for example, what Shikhanov and Eliashberg did to prove that uh, the, uh, to distinguish the Shikhanov uh, pair of knots, which are um, not Legendrian isotopic, but they're topologically equivalent, and they have the, they have the same classical uh, Legendrian knot invariance, their Benedictine number and <coughs> rotation. Okay, so, so it's a category that has some interest, but I'm not going to go in that direction. Category of sheaves, it has a local description, and that's a that's a great benefit. Uh, I can just tell you what it is by telling you what the sheaves have to uh, look like locally near the Lagrangian or near the, uh, the image of the Lagrangian downstairs. So let me, let me tell you that. So first of all, let me uh, uh, explain how I'm going to picture the Lagrangian. I, I picture its image downstairs, and upstairs, this is on X, which in, in this case, well, let's say, is R2. And generally, um, if the dimension of lambda is 1, then the dimension of X is 2. So I can draw pieces of X uh, right downstairs, and I'll, I'll, I'll picture the image of lambda. And then it also has uh, normal directions, which I'll typically draw as air. Co-normal directions, but whatever. Choose your favorite metric. Okay, so um, this is a piece of lambda. This whole picture will just sort of live inside an open set of x, and a, a piece of lambda which uh, which lies in, in infinity in the cotangent bundle of x, <coughs> and the image is a curve downstairs. That's good. Questions about the setup? It's a simple category to describe. So it's constructible sheaves. They're stratified by this picture, the image of lambda. And there's a finer stratification. So they're locally constant away from lambda. And, um, uh, and then they, have, they could have different stocks here. But uh, the, this hair gives a little bit uh, more refined notion, uh, which is kind of hidden in this notation. Let me explain. Let me just say. What it is, this is a subcategory of sheets on X. And uh, it's the oops, a sheaf in, in the sheaf in there has singular support inside lambda. That's what this notation here means. 
And so the singular support is some uh, stratification, but it's finer data. And uh, I'm just going to tell you the answer of what this uh, sheaf category looks like. So we have some stock of the sheaf uh, downstairs, which I'll write as head. And we have the, some uh, stock of the sheaf upstairs, the sections uh, upstairs, will be B. And along this not the, the uh, section of the stock will be A. I'm not going to write that. And uh, there's a map, which is the, just a restriction map. So here it's actually also A. And then you have a restriction to the downstairs, where it's A. And then you have a restriction to, to up above the map, where it's B. Does that make sense? If not, then the, you know uh, you can go get some other work done. <laughs> uh, that, that's that's sort of the essential ingredient here. Uh, it's a sheet, so it's uh, you know it's defined by sections on open sets. Here's an open set that surrounds the picture, and uh, we assign A to it. Down below, where the hairs point, that's also A, and up above, which is which, which is the same. I might as well choose that little open set. I get a restriction map. And it's B there. And because it's locally constant, if it's B there, it's B everywhere up there. So is this lambda this locally disconnected? There's a picture in the X over there. Yeah, so, sorry, this is a, this whole picture is this, this dotted circle is a subset, open subset of X, and this is the picture. Lambda lives in the coaster bundle, you project it down, that's a picture of it there. If you want to remember the information of the co directions, that's this little hair. That's, so this that's is the it. front projection. This is the front projection of this. Yeah, normally you might say, oh, well, the third direction is the derivative, but I've taken the normal, but that's, that's, uh, that's the only difference. Okay, that's, that's what the category looks locally. But of course, is because upstairs there's more things going on, the front projection could have other uh, aspects to it. And you could have a, a cusp somewhere. <coughs> And in that case, the category looks like it. A is still there. That's identity. And then you have this hair, described in the other direction. And you have these maps and this here. So not too much going on if you have a cusp. I actually won't have cusps for most of this talk. <coughs> but sometimes I will. And you can have a cross. <coughs> and the main part, no, not, I can't use the word part, uh, meat of this category is in what happens at the crossing. Um, you have a region here, 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 maps there, there, always against the grain, goes against the grain of the hair. Uh, and so you have that diagram, and it uh, mutes. But there's an uh, additional uh, condition which we might call the crossing condition, which is that uh, the complex that you build in this diagram is exact. It's, there's no going on. Varies under right and right removes. So we have uh, local uh, equivalences uh, uh, for each uh, right and right remove. And you can prove invariance with that as well. So the right of ice removes for Lagrange and that's look like um, that's right of ice for one, and there's a there's a mirror version of it as well, but I won't draw it There's right of ice for two and right of ice for three. <coughs> It's 
not hard to see uh, what, how to build these equivalences because of the crossing condition. What that says is that if you know A, B, A, B, and C, D has to be the cone of A, B, and C. The fact that this is a cyclic means that uh, this is a nice morphism as objects, uh, as complexes. Um, so you can fill in D, and so you can do that. You already you know this region and that region and the map between it. You can fill in what has to go in there, and that works pretty much all over. <coughs> okay, so that's um, that's it. Page one. Fifteen minutes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, that was my point. Sorry, yeah, some of the calculations will be hidden from the top. <laughs> um, this view is a letter that means micro, so I use it to mean uh, micro local. So micro local monodromy, I'm going to discuss in micro local rank. Um, so uh, let me uh, rem remind or tell or uh, explain uh, a little bit about what, how the, what the singular support of a sheet is. The singular support of a sheet F is measured uh, by what's called the uh, microlocal Morse group. So informally it tells you uh, where is this sheaf not a local system? As like downstairs here in A, we have this uh, local system in the region, it's locally constant. But as you move over to B, the scotch jump, and it was no longer. Uh, so you cross some sort of singularity in the local system, and that's measured by that hair. And that hair, if you, if you recall from what I was uh, discussing, if, if you move from uh, uh, that yellow little circle containing the uh, front projection of the knot, if you restrict downward, you actually get an isomorphism. But if you restrict upward, you don't. And the hair encodes that. And uh, that's what singular support means. It's the directions where the restriction map is not an isomorphism. Um, and uh, only slightly more formally, if I have a uh, if I have a covector, let's say. Uh, Covector in the cotangent bundle of X, uh, the microlocal Morse group at that covector is obtained as follows. Here's X, here's like a co direction, which I draw as a direction, but really co direction it should mean like a hyperplane. Um, so I take the hyperplane to find that. This is all on some small ball around X, small enough not to uh, contain any other interesting points in the stratification. And I have, uh, I look at a restriction map from the positive directions of that covector to the negative direction. And this is all, uh, there's a lot of people to credit for this technology. Um, Kashiwara and Shapira, uh, most specifically. Um, so what we do is look at the section over the positive, uh, the, the, what do we call it, the sublevel set of the positive covector, the sublevel set of the negative covector, and there's a restriction map there, and you take that, <coughs> the cone of that map, or, the, or that complex, and that's the microlocal Morse group. So to each cotangent vector, you can attach that, uh, that group, and uh, as you can see, all these, res all these uh, restriction maps in region A are isomorphisms. If it's an isomorphism, then the cone is zero, and we have non-singular uh, covectors. The covector is part of the singular support if this is a non-trivial cone, non-zero cone. So, is a C uh, is not in the signal support if uh, this cone is uh, zero. 
and then the singer support of the sheep is the the complement, or the closure of the complement of the non-singular locus. Okay. If, I don't know if that's too sheepy, then just go with that original gist, which is the directions where this where it's not a locus. Okay. Okay, so that's the micro local Morse group, and then we talk about um, that's a little uh, uh, discussion of uh, singular support, and we also write uh, C is going to be this category. It depends on the Lagrangian. We say that it's a micro local rank R if um, for all uh, C in the singular support. Um, let me just think for a second. I might as well just write single support. Um, the micro local Morse group is just a hard dimensional vector space, and, and that's it. If they're accustomed to the picture, there's a little bit that you need to do. <coughs> Maslow potential to your Lagrangian, which is the contact version of a grading to your Lagrangian. Um, but that we won't need to delve into that. Right? So there's a notion of rank of these, or micro local rank. No, no, it's not the rank of the sheep. I don't know where my uh, first example was. There's a little picture of what the category looks like. It's not the rank of A or the rank of B, it's the difference of, the, of those ranks, it has to be R. And we write uh, CR for the full subcategory of the micro local rank R objects. And we write MR uh, for the moduli. Uh, Okay. So that will be a uh, thing of interest to us. And now if you imagine, if you go back to this uh, original notion that this sheaf category was some stand-in for a Foucault category, and the Foucault category you put Lagrangians and they have local systems, uh, R is the rank of that local system. Because if you look at that Lagrangian at infinity, then it's this Lagrangian, and this is uh, uh, a rank R vector space that we could put onto the Lagrangian. So can you say that again? Yeah, let me uh, I, to say it better. Let me let me write one more thing. Um, then I'm going to forget to say something else. But okay, um, there's a functor, microlocal monodromy which goes from this category to local systems on the Lagrangian itself. <coughs> okay. The category is, we think of as the category of Lagrangian objects in the Pathaya category. Those Lagrangians bound a Lagrangian at infinity. So go back to this picture. If I have a local system here, I can restrict it to the boundary. Sorry, looking too long. I can restrict it to the boundary, I get a local system on the boundary. And microlocal monodromy is just that. You use the Morse group to restrict, to define a local system on the boundary. So let me uh, tell you what that looks like. And I can do this if I want the local system to be rank R, I can this, perform this operation on the microlocal rank R object. So if I have a object that sheet, I send it to some local system that depends on F, and at a point in the, the Lagrangian, I just get the Morse group. Make a little Morse group of that sheet. Uh, and you just have to put it in the right degree. So 
That'll be a rank R local system. So uh, take the kernel of this map, for example, and then that, and then that's something which you can define on here. Now that seems to work well, but then you might have a problem because what if you have a crossing? What I'm claiming is that you get a local system on the Legendre in itself. So if it's, uh, it has to travel across a crossing because it's a local system on the Legendre. And then to do that, you have to remember what this crossing condition was. The crossing condition said that this complex was acyclic, had no cohomology. And what that means is that these arrows provide an isomorphism between this cone and that cone. That's what that means. Uh, so what that means is that if you have your, uh, your cone of this uh, restrict, these restriction maps here, um, you get an isomorphism across the cross. And likewise here, you would have right, a map from down here to up there. You would take the cone of that map, and you would attach it to the Lodan chain here. And this isomorphism that the, these, uh, these arrows provide allows you to continue that local system across the process. I hope that makes some sense. I mean, it makes sense, but I hope it's understandable. <laughs> OK, um, and so this is the uh, analog in sheaves of what in the Fukai category you can do very simply, which is if you have a Lagrangian, just restrict the local system to the bound. But we get this one. Um, and then what we're interested in, if, you know, it's, it's very profitable in uh, Fukai category, as Kim Fukai was just telling us to. Uh, and many people have done as well. You take a, an object and you look at the moduli space uh, defined by that object together with rank one local system number. And so we're, inter we're particularly interested in C1 and M1, the moduli stack of rank one objects in this category. Maybe a quick aside, uh, which is that um, if, uh, if you have a not in R3, you'll just select one piece of this category, which is augmentations of the nut. Um, I had said previously that there, there was a containment, and now I can tell you exactly uh, what part of this category uh, corresponds to augmentation. Okay, I don't know if you're not here. So. Okay. And this micro local monodromy is compatible with the GKS isomorphism, so you can follow the local system across the uh, equivalence of categories as you isotope the map. Because every object set over a CR from some R. Well, those are sort of the whole, I mean, you could have a local system of uh, complexes. So, not necessarily. Or you could have a link where you have different one and a different object. Yeah, for a knot, then, uh, you know, it could be a complex. But if it's, uh, if it's not a complex, then, you know, and you're in a Okay, maybe some examples. Let's look at a B circle of I can I can speak locally. And look at the space of rank one objects, and let me uh, require all my sheets to be zero downstairs. And you know, I, won't, I won't put any mass cell potential, uh, so you don't have to worry about that, about that factor, or the mass cell potential will be zero. And now let's just use the definitions. What do they say? They say that if this is rank one, the cone of this map is rank one. 
Well, the maximum zero is the zero map, so rank one means that this has to be rank one. So, uh, so it has to be like C. <coughs> So I was getting confused about notation. So let's call the downstairs B0 and B1 has to be C. And now as we move up, same deal. The cone of this map has, has to be rank 1, but it already contains this piece. Uh, so this has to be C2. So the co kernel has to be rank 1. And so we get B2, another vector space, and we go up the line. And if there's n of these, uh, then we get uh, flag variety. In n dimension. So even just uh, the scripts may give you something interesting. Um, now let's uh, let's look at a local piece of something with a crossing. Introduce one crossing, and now you see over here on the left, because it's locally, because everything is local, you have a flag variety worth of choices on the left, and a flag variety worth of choices on the right. But they have to be compatible by this crossing condition. So um, what you get is you would have, and how much more data do you have here on the right? Well, this piece of the flag is the same. Here it's the same, it's the same, it's the same, it's the same, and it differs in one place. The two flags, they differ in one place. Um, and the crossing condition says that you can't just choose any other uh, flag in this place. Um, but it has to be different from here. So maybe it's the easiest if I just put the crossing at the, at the bottom strand, where this is 0, this is C, this is C, and this is C2, and we have two lines inside C2. And for this complex to be acyclic, it means to be that these lines have to be transverse inside C2. So they're transverse lines. Otherwise, this could have been any other line if I don't impose the crossing condition, and there's a P1 worth of choices. But instead, we get an A1 worth of choices. <coughs> five ring over flags, and that A1 sits inside P1. And you can continue this by adding more crossings. You get A1 bundle over A1 bundle over A1 bundle uh, over some flag variety, and this is some affine version, some affine bot sandal system variety. And these are the varieties. From these varieties, for example, you can construct uh, this is work of uh, Ben Webster. Jordy Williamson, we can construct Humphrey of the brain closure of that knot. So just another example that these uh, modular spaces are interesting things to consider. by one, so this is C2 here. And so we have these lines. We have this line in C2, this line in C2, this line, this line. And then here we have a map from C2 down to C. And that has to be a search action, and that, so it, uh, that has a cardinal. And it's one dimensional. The cone of that map has to be one dimensional. And uh, the cardinal is yet another line. And so you have five lines in P1. Five lines in C2, five points in P1, but we have all these crossings, so these lines have to be distinct. These lines have to be distinct. These lines have to be distinct. And actually, this uh, image of this map has to be distinct from the cardinal of that map. Otherwise, you could never build maps that give you the identity when you go the other way around. 
there was that cusp condition, which I didn't spend a whole lot of time on, which says if you go around the cusp, you get the identity. So this map has to be, uh, this line has to be distinct from that, and this line also has to be distinct from that. Is the Maslow potential what? what yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. The Maslow potential would be zero here and one there. So that actually shifts the degree of that cone. And, it, and it's actually in the right degree. Uh, so uh, the moduli space is these five points in P1, which is M05 uh, cyclic with this, with this uh, distinct <coughs> neighboring, neighboring point. So you can arrange them in a necklace or a pentagon of five points. And each one has to be distinct from its neighbor. So why is the first one not the same as the fourth one? Yeah, oh, it, it, maybe, maybe it is. But they're not the same as that one. Yeah. But, so, it's not five uh, so it's like this. They're not, they're not distinct from each other. That would just be M05. One, two, three, four, five. So that one's different from that one. That one's different from that one. That one's different from that one. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so now graphs come into the game. And this is also well uh, studied in that territory, but maybe not uh, in the perspective that, that I'm going to give. Or maybe, maybe so. As I said, there are many experts here for whom this won't be terribly surprising. I'm going to put zeros everywhere. I'm going to, I was allowing myself to define my category by uh, imposing loci where I get zero. And there's a picture. Oh, I drew, drew the picture in the wrong order. This was a PowerPoint presentation. That would be on layer two. And the layer one would have been the following. Uh, <laughs> hard to salvage. Okay. Okay. Layer one would have been this graph. And layer two would have been the zigzag paths of that graph. So let me underimpose the graph here. And now the Lagrangian is formed by the zigzag paths of that graph. So recall the zigzag paths is you make a right, let's say at the black turn, at the black points, uh, and, and a left at the white, and so you get this path. And if I smooth that out, I get uh, this curvy one here. And then this path that goes like that is this one here. And I guess they're canonically oriented then. And notice that uh, that separates uh, the surface into regions, and some regions uh, have the black dot, and they have the orientation going counterclockwise, and some regions have the white dot, and they have the orientation going clockwise. And then there are these null regions where I put the zero. <coughs> so we have uh, starting with a, a bicolored graph. Here it's bipartite. But, uh, you do inside a inside a surface, and from it we construct uh, the zigzag paths. Zigzag <coughs> paths, sometimes known as an alternating strand diagram, and those curves define a Legendre inside the poster bundle of the surface. Of the surface. So how am I going to take the Legendre? I'm going to take the left normal vectors. You go. That's my right, right hand rule. But, but it's producing the left direction. So everywhere, put the hair to the left of the orientation. So because they're canonically oriented, you get this hair. And that defines the Lagrangian circle bundle. And of course, then we have a category, and uh, it's the category that we look for, and we look at microlocal rank one objects. And the point is that this picture defines a microlocal rank one sheet. Um, how, do, how does it define that sheet? Well. Uh, I'll, just, I'll tell you what it is. I don't know how illuminating it is. Uh, you have these white regions, and you take the constant sheaf of the white regions, and you uh, extend it by zero. That's what that means. You have to shift it. And then uh, there's an extension from the constant sheaf of the black regions. Just push forward. Uh, and that extension defines sheet F, actually a family of sheets F, if you take a non-trivial extension of each of these uh, crossings, and that gives us the sheet F, and that will live inside uh, <coughs> this category. Under the graph. So that maybe is hard to see geometrically, but in fact, um, you also get from this data, and you get the corresponding Lagrangian. <coughs> Under the isomorphism of sheaves with the Foucault category, I can either tell you what sheaf you get or what Lagrangian you get. And in this case, we're lucky where you can identify both. I can identify both the sheaf and the corresponding Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian is um, 
Well, it, it looks like if you take a vector field here, that uh, any vector field that's uh, strongly outward at the boundaries, that that's what the Lagrangian looks like. So the graph of that vector field, or the graph of that uh, one form corresponding to that vector field, is what that Lagrangian looks like here. And uh, here it's an inward vector field. And you just you have to study locally how to describe what this Lagrangian looks like around this place where it twists. But that's a local um, calculation that you do. And you can explain then how to get an exact, that's key, uh, exact Lagrangian <coughs> object of the time. And not only that, this is the corresponding So under the isomorphism of sheets with the pi, uh, this sheet corresponds to that object. And as you as you will know, you can put the different uh, C, uh, U, uh, C star local systems on this object. You get a whole family of objects, and that corresponds to the different possible extensions that you can get. Correct. So now we have some connection uh, to the geometry here. And therefore, so we get a chart. So if your Lagrangian happens to have come from a bicolor graph, then you have a distinguished open subset of the Microlocal rank one moduli space, um, but not all uh, Lagrangians. Not all Lagrangians come from graphs in this way. <coughs> and so we have to study what happens. How is this connected to mutation? So we have a chart, and what about other charts? So the story is, if you isotope. Isotope. Uh, to, um, the, to, let's say, uh, zigzags of a new graph prime, which implies uh, we've got this chart isotope to a zigzag of a new graph, uh, then we'll get a new chart. In the new category, the category defined by that isotope, which I knew, but there's an equivalence of categories and therefore an equivalence of modular spaces defined by DKS. So I can identify this with an open set inside the original. <coughs> modulized space. And the point is that these are different compared to these charts. So you coordinate them and compare them, and they, they overlap, but they're different. And you can compare them, for example, by some common middle ground. Or however you want to compare them, I'll show you how to do it. And they're related. So there's uh, some coordinates which I'll describe. They're related by mutation. That's like the main calculation. I'll do a little piece of it for you. Um, and the main uh, result here um, and further. Uh, <coughs> Uh, this can uh, be proven uh, with the following calculation. So I only need to understand sort of locally what happens as I isotope. Uh, 
the knot, and it goes from one uh, bike color graph to another. And the famous move that does that is the square move. So let's, let's discuss the square move, which, which will transform this uh, graph. Remember, that produced a chart in some moduli space. And I can identify the moduli space spaces different isotope versions. Um, so let me draw, let me start isotoping this Lagrangian. These, if you remember the hairs, they go like that. So actually that, <coughs> this curvy one and that lower curvy one, those hairs go in opposite directions. You can pass them right through each other. That's called the bygone move uh, in, in, in the graph. Uh, language of cluster. Um, you have these bicons, and you can eliminate them. And if you eliminate them, you just pass, that's just a Legendrian isotopy. You get the following picture. Like that. So there are these four regions. These were all zero regions. Then there are these four boundary regions, which we're going to fix. Because I'm going to do a framed version of this story because I'm doing a local calculation. And as I do that isotopy, I don't change anything on the boundary. I won't put the zero in anymore. I get that Lagrangian, and the hair goes. Uh oh. No, the hair goes right. This comes down. Uh oh. No. Yeah. yeah, good. This would be this way. This will be this way. And if you remember the maps, you get these maps. And uh, so these are zero. E, S, W, and N should be rank one uh, vector spaces. And in the middle, it has to be some rank two vector spaces. So we get four lines uh, in C2. But it's, frame, it's a frame story, which means I have uh, bases for these lines. So I can just organize in the four. I can organize the four lines by four vectors inside C two. Uh, north, west, south, right? and I can think of this matrix as uh, a set of these matrices with some open subset of G R. Four. And there are some conditions. It's, it's open subset because of these crossing conditions. So east and north have to be different lines, which means that this determinant of the first two uh, has to be uh, non-zero. So that's some Clocker coordinate. And so these sort of cyclically consecutive Clocker coordinates have to be non-zero. Okay. So that's part of the isotopy. That's half of the square move. Note that this is not the, the, some zigzag halves of any of any graph. This is some intermediate. But now I can I can reverse the process to do uh, get the zigzag halves. The graph related by the square move, and if we're careful, this will look like. And this is square move related graph. So notice that we could not flow in it. We, we started with an exact Lagrangian submanifold, we got a chart. And now we have some, we could build an exact Lagrangian submanifold here and get another chart. And because these moduli spaces are the same, I can put them both inside this moduli spaces, this moduli space, and I get two different charts, and they will be different, and they'll be related by mutation. But there's no way to connect this uh, picture to that picture just through zigzag diagrams of, uh, of graphs. If you try to do that, uh, you have uh, something in the some cycle on the surface which would have to shrink to zero. Um, I wrote this too big. I'm going to erase this. If you try to connect through alternating strand diagrams of graphs, you would have something singular in the middle. And so there's no path uh, in the exact 
uh, Lagrangian submanifold from this one to that one. There is an exact Lagrangian submanifold here that generates a chart. There's one here that generates a chart, but there's no there's no path. No, 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 no. Uh, these exact uh, these exact Lagrangian submanifolds cannot be Hamiltonian equivalent to one another. So if you know how many cluster charts there are, you might be able to and you do conjecture about how many Hamiltonian equivalence classes of, of exact Lagrangian submanifolds there are uh, uh, with, uh, with this boundary condition. Or in other words, how many distinct fillings, exact fillings are there of your Lagrangian map. Um, yeah, and so, so that's some actual symplectic uh, consequence that you can derive from this picture. Oh, wait, I'm not done. But this is along the way. You feel fast. Save your long 10 minute questions for three minutes. Uh, all right, I won't do the computation of how to do that, uh, that uh, compare them, but it, it follows through this micro local monodromy. You compare the micro local monodromy from north to east here versus from north to east here. And that's uh, in the language of the uh, cluster. That's, uh, uh, Hosnikov, who I forgot to say, uh, that's called the boundary measurement map. Okay, maybe write down a few examples of how this plays out, and then just finish with it. It's always the case that you give a talk to find out that John and the soy woman, Maxime Kinsevich, have, uh, have already written or talked or worked on uh, something similar. Uh, and and, and uh, this uh, appears in also the work of uh, uh, the Sark of Tony Tank of Kinsevich, um, where you can describe, you can encode uh, the Stokes data of an irregular singularity. So when I say encodes, I mean M1. Of this spirograph encodes the Stokes state of some irregular singularity of a differential equation. And why is that? It's because when the Stokes state is a set of flags, the, the growth rate of solutions of differential equations near a singularity, uh, the solutions of some fixed growth uh, obey a flag. As you uh, are more and more permissive in your uh, growth of the singularity, you get more and more solutions. And you pick up this whole flag. But then you have the Stokes phenomenon where the solutions uh, where the flags are related uh, by some uh, switch of the uh, growth rate of the singularity. And so you encode this is the space of all Stokes data, this is M1. Okay, so then, uh, so you get uh, a wild, what's called a wild character variety. Because uh, you have these flags. Oh, I guess you could have, yeah, you could have uh, several solutions uh, at the same, growing at the same rate. Okay. Another, uh, so it's, uh, this is a Betty version. Uh, of the spectral curve construct. <coughs> Sasha Gantra has spoken about that in his work, and his work with the uh, as well. Um, other examples of it. Right, the positroid uh, strata of uh, the Grassmannian. The Grassmannian has a Schubert decomposition. But it also has a, a finer decomposition <coughs> positroid cells. And uh, those strata are clusters. And they also arise as M1 of some well-chosen Legendre and submanifold. 
So let me, uh, I'll just write down a picture of a point in what, GR3 phi. <coughs> so that 3 by 5 matrix defines some point in GR3 phi. And the positified uh, uh, stratum is labeled by the ranks of this matrix. So if I was just looking at this Schubert stratum, I would take the rank of this, and the rank of these two, these three, and so on, and collect them together. So I get rank one, and then rank two, and then rank three, 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 and then I can put zeros and threes at the end. And uh, now if I start here, rank one, and then this matrix is rank two, and then this is still rank two, still rank two. One, two, 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 three, one, two, three, and so on. And that's uh, called the cyclic rank matrix. And if you fill in the zeros and threes, you can build a Rajanjian, just by, <laughs> yes, that's what you do. Uh, Sorry, I meant it. this has to turn this way, this has to turn this way, and this Lagrangian will live inside the cylinder, and it keeps it going, because eventually you repeat. And that Lagrangian in that cylinder, the moduli space, is uh, the positroid uh, stratum with its cluster structure labeled by this rank matrix. And you can actually encode uh, any cluster X variety that you like. In, into this picture. So starting with the cell, and this is work of uh, my collaborators in the separate paper, starting with the seed, the cluster seed, they can construct the Weinstein manifold um, whose moduli space will produce the appropriate cluster. Variety. All right, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, so I don't know that, uh, so in higher dimensions you're talking about, so if the, if the Legendrian was a co-normal bundle of a knot, in uh, Legendrian torus in more dimensions, then you'll have the same sort of basic structure for each filling, you get a chart in the moduli space, uh, but uh, who knows about the combinatorial structure and the coordinate changes as you, as you compare overlapping charts for two different exact fillings. I don't know if there's any higher dimensions. Yeah, so, so. Be in Korea, it's a different story. Different story. Different story. <laughs>